Recording in progress. Okay, we're good. Blue, we're live? Okay. All right, this is a uh, public hearing. Today is Monday, July 26, and uh, there are th three items. Uh, I'm going to call to order. Uh, the first is to uh, hear about Ordinance uh, 8-23, an ordinance to amend the Municipal Code of the City of Lewis, uh, Chapter 197, Zoning Section 197-59, Historic District or Property Criteria, the standard to include cultural and social significant structures. Um, Janelle, you want to introduce this one for us? I'd be happy to. Thank, Thank you. you so much. So this is an ordinance to add cultural and social significant structures into um, the purpose and the standards for review by the Historic Preservation District Commission. No, the Historic Architectural Review Commission. Sorry, it's been a it's been a long day. Um, so um, it, it's referenced. Some of the items are referenced in the purpose, but um, there was a request to make it a little bit stronger and actually have that as part of a criteria and a standard to be used when an application comes before the, the commission. So those were added into uh, 197 59 historic district or properties cri criteria and standards. And it um, just added social and criteria, cultural or and in particular the, the character of the immediate area um, relating to cultural and, and cultural significance of the structures. Um, so those were the, the main changes um, and that they are to be used as part of criteria when reviewing an application. Before we uh, hear from the public, Blue, are, are there participants online as well? How many do we have so far? There's just three? Okay. So th the way that this will work, I want to take some comments from the dais first or some comments and questions and then we'll go to the uh, the folks who are here um, intermittently if more folks get on I like to toggle back and forth just to keep them engaged but it doesn't look like there's too many on so we'll do we'll do that first so anyone from the dais that has any comments or que or clarification questions before we t turn it over to the public I do <laughs> go, go ahead Tim thank you uh, yes I'd like to direct your attention to uh, the second page, and it's line number 61, and the, uh, the word choice is uh, uh, character of the immediate area, the word immediate. Can you, is there any definition that's offered for what is immediate? So typically from a planning perspective, it would be uh, adjacent across the street, it, depending on how big a block is, maybe that block, but that would be immediate. You wouldn't be going three blocks over, you wouldn't be going a half mile away. You, you're really looking at, you know, that side of the street, maybe the other side of the street, usually within that same block. Okay, I'm familiar with the practice of applicants in front of H Park providing photographs to support their requests. Yeah, you know, where they will find other examples in the immediate area to, you know, that illustrates what they're trying to accomplish. Is that is that what you would consider is that kind of? Um, yeah, normally what we see, um, what become is submitted for additional uh, photos for, for the historic district applications, are properties that are adjacent to. Every once in a while, you get somebody who's trying to make an argument of a material that's been used elsewhere in the historic district. Okay. But in this instance, again, you're looking, um, you know, in that you're you're more looking for like or within that blocker. Okay, so within a block. Uh, again, depending on how big I the just, block is, and right. yeah, we're not. Again, we're not going to look. Okay, if so it's, it's in a ship, reasonable distance. Yeah, if it's like in Ship Carpenter Square, we're not going over to Schley Avenue. Ooh, I mean, yeah, that's sure. You know, that would be a stretch. Yes, yeah, that's that's really a stretch. yeah, it really is a stretch. Both historic and districts. I like to walk too. All right, thank you for that <laughs> clarification. You're um, next question I have is on the next page, uh, line one thirty one, uh, line number or a section or whatever it's called fourteen. And it says the H Park shall provide equity when reviewing applications. Uh, can you just what is the definition of equity in the sense of reviewing applications? 
So I think um, what they're looking there is making sure everybody's treated the same as an application goes through. So if you're using the same criteria for one application, you know, um, the same concepts are being used for the next application. Now again, every application is going to be slightly different and every application, because every house is a little bit different, every sure. building is a little bit different, but you're using the same criteria for each application. So okay, you know, if we're, if we're going to use, you know, cedar, you know, is that cedar the same for that house versus something else? Um, is the, the mass and the scaling um, the same, you know, because that, that, you know, so it's, it's looking to making sure that I'm like, I'm not going, uh, you know, I'm not just grabbing something, you know, like, oh, you want hot pink, you know, paint color, which again is something they could look at and going, you know, we want that as, as a house in the historic <laughs> district, which it's typically not seen in here. Um, but using, you know, the same criteria and the same use of the criteria. Right. So that actually fits in. Actually, also, it would include, going back to my first question about immediate area, that's an equity-related issue as well, correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. I don't have any other questions at this time. Okay. I had a couple of questions. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, one, the uh, height, new and renovated structure should be in harmony with the streetscape. Uh, there's Line number, please. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, 80. Okay. Um, there are, are times when uh, a new building might be put in that would be uh, closer to our, our maximum height requirement. Um, and it says in harmony. Uh, I can think of a few places, for example, in Ship Carpenter, where we moved uh, uh, a bigger, larger, higher building was moved in than had been there presently. Um, is that something that will be negotiable? So there's a section in the code um, for properties in the, in the historic district that can use an existing building height. So you keep that scaling and that massing so you don't end up with, you know, some because we recognize some of the buildings in the historic district are taller than 30 and a half feet. So there's um, the existing building height that if you're within 100 feet, the building official um, with cause and re review by the historic district can allow that building to go up to 36 feet. So again, you're keeping it with that scale and that massing of that houses in the adjacent area. Now, would, would this include the... Uh Second Street area, Third Street area, the center of our town as well. Anything that's zoned historic, there's okay. an existing building height in the, and it's not in this section. It's in the bulk standards and dimensional requirements. Okay, so that would include anything that would be pre-existing or might come in on a lot that would be empty. Yes, there's okay. a, a, again, if we, you're with you're in a hundred feet, mm -hmm. um, and we had one, and they were like trying to use a house that was like. 300 plus feet away, and I'm like, I'm sorry, you can't use that. Okay. Um, so they ended up being um, the 30 and a half feet, but uh, there's another one that's going in on Savannah that'll be taller. Okay. To be so, keeping so with the neighbors. Possible. Yes. Okay. So my other question would be uh, 91 scale, since the scale of the city of Lewis is intimate in nature, any building contrary to that streetscape will be deemed out of place. So that seems. Um, kind of definitive and I wonder if that shouldn't be a may instead of a will. So typically when you're looking at historic standards and some of the historic standards are um, consistent with the Secretary of Interior standards that regulate historic structures and the renovation um, and reconstruction of historic structures is what you're looking not to do is if you have a row of one and a half two-story houses you don't want to start having three and four-story houses and then a one-story house, you want them all to be that two, two and a half story or within a certain height of each other so they <clears> look <throat> like they belong together um, aesthetically. Okay, so, so is there any, any room for variability in this in case uh, there would be some larger structures built in the city at some point that might be out of scale to others but would be historical in nature and meet the other requirements? I think that might be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis, and somebody can always request a variance from the Board of Adjustment okay, if there's need to, to um, exceed something or go beyond something. But um, typically, they go to the Board of Adjustment first, and then okay. can go to the Historic District Commission. You can run them concurrently, um, but we do encourage that Board of Adjustment first. Okay. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, <coughs> Carolyn. No. Okay. All right, then let's turn to um, those in attendance. George, come on up. You know the drill. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. I'm uh, George Thomason from uh, Fort Jefferson Court. And I just have a question. I don't know, I don't know the line number because I didn't bring any paperwork with me. Um, could you be a little bit more specific about what you mean when you say uh, cultural significance and cultural historical significance? That's a little broad. And exactly. um, if we could just get sure. That's what well, you mean by that. If we want to bring it up, it's, it's line, I believe you're referring to lines 65 and 66. Six. Is that? It's actually. It's kind of throughout yeah. the, okay. the ordinance. Um, so typically, when you're talking about social and cultural, um, some of the bigger things um, you can think about is, you know, sometimes it's the people who've lived there or had um, an art studio, like a famous artist, in that building, and that was their main. That that will have some type of social or cultural significance. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, maybe how the building was used. Um, was it used for uh, um, an exist, uh, you know, some type of, of a specific group that used that building that has some type of significance to it? Um, so that would be something you'd be looking at. Um, so there's, it can take a, a number of different things. Um, mostly in California, what you've seen is things that are are um, LGBTQIA+, plus. if I missed that up, I apologize. But that's usually either seeing a lot of cultural significance or, um, again, there was an artist um, and they were famous in like the 60s and they found their building that they worked out of so that was in their main studio and they went in and, you know, that has a cultural or a social significance because people remembered that person. Um, so a number of different ways it can be interpreted. And it is, it is broad, and those words are broad. It's very broad. Um, but to your example, um, if an artist lived in a home uh, for 40 years um, and then moved away, passed away, whatever, um, are you saying that H Park should take into consideration that whatever that was done to that property as a studio or what have you, a, and I, I'm assuming we're talking about residential, not commercial property, right? Um, it, could be, so it could be both. That we would, okay, well, in, okay, both, but uh, so I'm not talking about an art gallery where, you know, um, on Second Street or Third, I'm sorry, that's Third, um, the artist co op is, right. my apologies. Um, that is, you know, commercial property's been a uh, art gallery for years, so the implication that should be uh, the next um, use of that property should be for a gallery? No, no, I think, say if, and I'm just gonna, if Picasso had their main studio on Third Street in a building, and you had done their significant work out of that building, you know, and then you do the research and it's like, well, is that something that should be protected? That building should be protected in that cultural history of Picasso do and doing work out of that building. Should that be protected? And again, it's not saying it has to be maintain an art studio. It can be a different use or some places be they become interpretive centers or, you know, again, residences. But it's like, do you put like a plaque or somehow to, to designate and to recognize that, you know, a famous artist did a lot of work there. Okay, and then to my example of a residential property where an artist had lived there for 40 years and had uh, done things to the property that he liked, are you saying that we should pervert, per, we should take that into consideration when an application comes before us, that, that there was an artist that lived in that house for 40, 50 years, um, and that we need to take that into consideration. That's a, a real question. Mm -hmm. Not, yeah. not, no, yes. not I'm not trying question. to be belligerent or anything like that. Yes, that is something that could be taken into consideration. Okay. Um, so when you take social and cultural um, a value, uh, what do you mean by social? I, again, it could be a cause. Um, it could be, you know, uh, you know, the African-American population, it could be other populations, 
um, Native, Native American. American population, if it has some type of historic, I think a good example would be like the Cannonball in the Cannonball House. That has a cultural significance, even though I think it's a replica. Um, I, I could be wrong in that. The can, well, I thought it was. Um, I don't think it was the original cannonball. No, it's not. that's what I thought. It's not. <laughs> but it is a cannonball. Okay. So, so again, again, there's a cultural significance. Um, um, I want to think. Um, there's a couple of like uh, bars in New York that have a social significance. Um, for different groups right. um, and different um, cultures. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and it's not every, not every structure does not have a social and cultural significance, but some do. And it's, you know, what is important to protect and preserve. Or not to preserve. Correct. Not to preserve. No. And I'll give you an example of that. I'll give you an example of that. Please. Because it's come up a number of times where uh, Dr. Earl Bradley's home on Savannah, Savannah Street, Savannah Avenue, mm -hmm. uh, many people have fought to preserve that home because of its architectural significance. And I would submit there was a certain, that has happened. Yes. My understanding about your example is that there was a, a bunch of uh, folks around that wanted that house totally demolished. Correct. And it be made into a memorial park. Um, but the preserving the house for its significant value would have gone to the general uh, guidelines in the ordinance as far as historic preservation, not because Dr. Bradley lived there. Right. So can you? I, I'm sorry, I don't understand because well, I, say I don't understand yours. <laughs> well, well, what I, my understanding is, and and Mrs. Warnell is here, and others who spoke out about this, that this was, use that as an example of a home that was preserved and that because it had significant architectural value. Okay. And Mrs. Warnell can you know, comment on that later or now if you'd like. Well, and my point is that with regards to social considerations, cultural considerations, I think there would be a significant amount of people who would argue that yes, it might have architectural significance in its design and such, but but the deplorable and and background of that home is enough to say yes, it should be demolished because someone who, for example, so this was brought up to me more than once now, as uh, from someone who was potentially a victim of him and still lives in Lewis, does not want to drive up and down Savannah Avenue and go by that house that may have architectural significance, but does not, at least to them and probably others, doesn't have social significance. Okay. Um, I think that covers my question. Um, is, if the language in there could be somewhat a little bit more specific, I think that would be very helpful to anyone who serves on the, the commission uh, when they have to determine whether or not something is historically significant because of its structure and also significant because of its social and cultural background. So that's my request, yeah. if there's any language that could be added to make that a little bit more clear. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. George. OK. Um, let's see if anyone else from the in-person audience wants to make comments. Otherwise, we'll turn. Is there anyone that's? on the line that's make wants to make a comment okay looks like mr is it daryl daisy yeah, just okay just so blue why don't you go ahead and open that up and then we'll make sure so uh, daryl can you hear us looks like you've unmuted yes i, th I hear you fine. okay go ahead yeah i don't want to take up too much time i think uh, my family's already commented on the ordinance in the past Basically, you know, that I, I, we support the ordinance um, mainly because we believe the um, communities, um, the uh, legacy communities in, in Lewis are being <coughs> adversely affected by some of the um, rules and criteria of H Park. Um, we've, we've already addressed it, you know, basically the, the uh, Native American community is pretty much gone from Lewis. 
the African American community is is you know one percent these days, which is is a dramatic reduction. Um, and you know, I know H Park does a great job with preserving the homes and preserving the looks of the old middle class Lewis or working class Lewis. But they also have to start taking into consideration the actual people who who were there as well. So again, don't want to be long. Just want to uh, say we support the ordinance. All right. Thank you, Mr. Daisy. Anyone else from the room? Barbara, Barbara come on. Hi, Barbara Warnell, 53K Penlopen Drive, Lewis. Um, I wanted to continue along the lines that George was going somewhat. Um, one of the things, uh, and, and I appreciate the intent and all the hard work you did in that, um, and all the extra information that you just offered, I thought that was really great. Um, I think the um, more user-friendly guidelines can be, the more easier, it's easier for both the commissioners, but, but easier for applicants. Applicants shouldn't have to ponder and struggle over different words. Now, I understand sometimes the words, you can only come up with somewhat vague words to describe stuff. And, and you know, you're kind of, everybody's caught between a rock and a hard place. But um, the, you know, I'll go back to the first item, social or cultural. I mean, the average person on the street, even you guys, I think if you all had to write down what that meant, it would be hard. You wouldn't just know it. Um, setbacks, height requirements, things like that, they're easy. Um, and, and then sometimes y y you might want to take a look at this and make sure it's not written in a way that means you, anybody's required to address it because it might not, it may or may not be applicable to a particular application. Um, so the, you know, for instance, social or cultural. I mean, it, you know, an application may come before us that really there is nothing social or cultural about that particular building or anybody that lived there. And we're, we're, we're really addressing the buildings. And that is why, that is why uh, the Bradley House survived. Uh, we had a public hearing. There was an outpouring, a majority, a heavy majority of people that did not want that house demolished. Everybody on H Park thought it was going to be the opposite and fully expected that, was, that they would demand that it be demolished, and they didn't. And their statements were the house did not commit a crime. And I understand the person that you re re referenced. Multiple people, by the way. Okay, and I understand that. And, and there's really, um, uh, I don't know the answer to that. No, it's a tough, tough yeah. issue, no yeah. question about it. Yeah, and, and um, but you know, that's, that's how that, that proceeded. And, the, and, um, and we had people, several couples that wanted to put a bid on it you know, at that hearing, so, which was not our job. <laughs> so, you know, some of these things, uh, go through and reread it and see whether there should be a may or may not apply kind of item to make sure right. that we all don't get stuck trying to figure out how we address this if it just isn't applicable or consider, maybe it's a consider mm -hmm. something like that. Um, and. The, uh, the next one, item 59 through 61, it says general compatibility of exterior design, arrangement, texture, and materials proposed to be used with other st structures contributing, proposed to be used with other, with other structures contributing to the established character. I don't even, I'm not sure why we include with other structures, but to be, to be uh, contributing to the established character of the historic district of Lewis, and in particular, the character of the immediate area. Isn't that what our streetscape does? Mm -hmm. We have a category called streetscape, and that's kind of compatibility of the street, both in character and height and things like that. I mean, it, it's, 
maybe it's just repetitious of the same thing. I don't know. I, d I just I questioned it. I said I thought. Barbara, we can I interrupt you? What line was that you were reading from? Uh, Sixty-one. Thank you. You know that that's was my first reaction. Okay. If I had to explain that to somebody, I said, well, I think it's basically very similar to streetscape. In in, and in particular, the character of the immediate area. Barbara, can I take you back mm -hmm. a few minutes to what you meant we're talking about with the Bradley okay. House? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because this is a public hearing. Mm -hmm. Are you meant to say <clears throat> that if the public. No, I didn't mean to say anything. If the public. Could, <laughs> if the public consensus had been that it would be better for that house to be removed, that you would have gone that way rather than the fact that it was acceptable to keep the structure because the structure hadn't done any, I mean, that's, I'm pretty sure that's what you said. Well, I said, uh, no, I didn't say that at all. I said, much to our surprise, there was an outpouring, a, a majority, a great majority outpouring for the house not to be de demolished. An outpouring from whom? The public. It was a public hearing. So that is what you said. I said public. I just said the public. I didn't say what... Uh, HPC would have done at the time. I just said, much to our surprise, at the public hearing, the majority, a great majority of people spoke in support of keeping the house and with the statement, the house did not commit the crime. Mm. So it's a, you know, it, it's a two-sided coin and it can go either way on any particular issue. Like life. Okay. So that, and then um, we get down to uh, line 65 and 66, um, we're, we're back to, you know, may or may not apply, I, I take it, because it could or could not have cultural significance of the structure. You know, so I don't, I just want to be careful in the attempt to add clarity and good information or helpful information, both for applicants and the commissioners, don't try not to make it more confusing. Mm. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, online um, starts with 100. Next page. And this is, I'm not going to read it all. I'll read it where it starts with the historic district. A um, couple of lines down. When owners of a structure in the historic district designated as contrib contributing structures make application to H Park for alteration or demolition, preserving the property will be H Park's primary criterion in evaluating the application. The applicant shall have the burden of demonstrating that the alteration or demolition of the structure meets the purpose of this article and or addresses the health, safety, and welfare of the immediate area. Now, to me, that sounds more like a code issue. And our applications are supposed to be completely vetted by code. We are not supposed to see anything that hasn't already passed a code review. So. You know, some of this, to me, sounds like it would be. So you're saying it's up. To, I mean, I, I think it's. I think it sounds like when I read this, I think, well, wouldn't that be addressed by a code review? Mm -hmm. So my reading of that is just it's the applicant has the burden of proof to request for any changes or demolition of the of the bill of the structure per that code, and or address any health safety or so welfare not, issues. But then, so you don't see that going into H Park's responsibility at all, correct? That's not H Park's responsibility. This is just the applicant's responsibility? Yeah, the okay. very first line says, the applicant shall have the burden of proof, because the applicant always has the burden of proof to request, if they want to do an addition, why do they need to do an addition? In this case, mm -hmm. it would be some type of altering or demolition of a structure. Mm -hmm. So the burden of proof falls onto the applicant. And we also r clearly wanted to make sure that if there was, a, you know, <laughs> there's a tree growing in a house, mm -hmm. is there an issue with a safety, health, and welfare of mm -hmm. the immediate area? Um, so I think that's where that's looking at. 
So it really doesn't have anything to do with age part. No, it's the burden. It, it's an, it's making it clear that the burden of proof does fall on the applicant. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. That's where I was going. All right. Then down to um, 127, number 13, which is an addition. The H Park shall take uh, shall take efforts to safeguard and enhance the historic heritage of the city by preserving the elements. I just put a question mark there which reflect the cultural, social, economic, political, or architectural history of the city. And I, I mean, if, I, if we wanted to add, some of these words I almost think need to then have a definition so people don't misconstrue them. You're gonna use words that are kind of vague and you could probably ask 10 people mm -hmm. and get 10 different answers. And if you look them up in the dictionary, you'll probably get, mm -hmm. you may get mm -hmm. you know, a variety of, of explanations. So some of the words that we're discussing, I think maybe you should decide on a definition on how it's to be used in this document. And then we will add that to the definition section as well. Otherwise, I think we're gonna get a lot of people saying, well, no, that's not what it means. So elements, which were, I mean, are elements part of the building? Is that what elements are? I would think that's how I would take it, but it doesn't, it, it could be something else. Mm -hmm. and, and so, and then, and, and then should, should it be another one of those spots that it may, you may consider this or may not? I mean, maybe in some cases it's very appropriate. Like the artist that used to live in a, in a garage behind a particular house, you know? Um, that may give, that gives value and historic meaning to that garage. But it might not to the next garage that somebody wants to tear down and is falling down. You know? So, you know, there's so many gray areas and so many ifs. So I would just ask that all of the words, some of which we've been discussing, you know, you, if you think they could be confusing, they probably are, and it could be misinterpreted, and so maybe we need to also consider adding definitions of how you intend to use those words in, in this application. And then number four. Barbara, we're going to give you two more minutes. I've given you 10. So we oh, typically give. The last you know, one is five. back on number 14, and it's that word equity. Somebody called me about that today, and they say, I think that means money, finances. Is H Park financing something? And I said, no, no. But so again, <clears throat> if equity means equal, then maybe we should use the word equal instead of equity. Anytime you mm -hmm. can use a simple word sure. to You're clarify. Right something, please, that's really what we should all yeah. do. Yeah. Instead of making things more confusing or vague or iffy. Now, I understand there's a lot of times you cannot describe art uh, frequently without talking about emotions. Yeah. But this, anyway, my time's up. Thank you very no much. Problem. And thank you for all the work you're doing. And thank again, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, but if there are folks uh, that d either don't feel compelled to speak tonight or if you have additional comments that might come across after you leave tonight, please feel free to continue. Uh, or Can, when's realistic leave the, o the period open to? I, I neglected to address that. Um, I would say the Friday before the, so the, uh, the 7th of July. Okay. Because that would be um, either noon or close of business. Comment, yeah. Um, because that way then you will have that information for the July 10th meeting. So let's call it um, seven, seven. one o'clock on seven seven. So we need to have those in so that because the, the staff needs to put together our packets and uh, frankly we need to have time to look at the public comments before the 10th. So uh, we'll leave it open to seven seven at one, one o'clock. That day. Okay. And before before you come up, Trina. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I just wanted I wanted to kind of comment and um, on Mrs. Warnell's comments, which I think were very sound in the sense that she was citing a lot of uncertainty, ambiguous words, which are fair. It's really difficult to talk about these issues. It leaves a lot of discretion, and I think we need to continue to tighten this up. And because the, really the intent, at least from my perspective, of proposing these changes is to add, ironically, clarity 
to to this because we've all discussed and we all know it's in plain this is part is in plain writing is that the purposes section of the code discusses as Janelle pointed out architectural social economic political and social his factors whereas the criteria section does not mention all those just solely focuses on architecture so there's been a disconnect there so there is a need to bring this in and I think it's important because the 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 chair the chairwoman on down needs to understand what the least this council's intent is in the past I know social quote unquote social or cultural has been used example 421 Savannah Street is a medical building that has a single single structure behind it that sits there and is, functions as office space that was not allowed to be demolished this is 15 years ago approximately because it supposedly there was some some evidence that that building housed the first bb the uh, mer, uh, operating room for bb hospital mm -hmm. so that had nothing to do really with architectural it was a standard building but because it had that bit. so the social and cultural considerations have been employed in the past and i think what we're just trying to get at at least again i don't want to speak for, for myself is to your point, Mrs. Warnell, clarity, so that we know what we're looking at here, and it makes, and there's always gonna be, be terms that can be used interchangeably or have various meanings, but I, I applaud your efforts, and I hopefully we can all sit down and, and try to make this as tight as possible. Trina, come on up. Well, Trina's coming up, if I can, um Real quick, um, even the National uh, Alliance of Preservation for Commissioners had a, um, a seminar about something about how do they look at social and cultural, and there is gray into it because it's how do you make that argument because it's, it's something newer that people are taking a look at. It's not just a building to be protected. It's some type mm -hmm. of social or cultural um, that happened. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, Trina Brown Hicks, 504 DuPont Avenue. So um, Ms. Warnell had mentioned there were certain areas um, where, um, and please forgive me if I misinterpret, <laughs> certain areas where the words may or may not should be considered in, in the uh, Code. writing. And so my question is, who determines whether may or may not the applicant or H part, and if the applicant says, I want it to be considered, will it be considered? Hmm. Is, that, is there a question though around a may or shall, or is, it, is there a may not? May not, it was may not in there? Well, the, it was may or may not. By the way, my grandmother's name was Willie May Not, so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, back to the one that, that Councilperson Elder brought up, that, that was the use of the word may in the context of height, and I think that, you know, th there, um, I guess that in that instance, it was the use of the word will rather than may, and, and you know, sometimes in the, the context of something like height, where you could have something extremely tall coming in, you want some discretion on, on mm -hmm. H Park to say, in some instances we will, not in this instance. This is this is too much, and, and you know it when you see it, kind of thing. Um, so I think that the use of those words, being a little bit discretionary in this sort of an ordinance, is so that H Park, given their expertise in reviewing these sorts of applications, can have some flexibility in determining what is actually, you know, appropriate in the broader context of what what Lewis is trying to protect versus what may not be. Mm. So, Trina, typically in those criteria, it's, it's the burden that always falls on the applicant, and it's right. the co the committee that has the, you know, they can or they can or they shall. Shall would mean you have to do it. May means, yeah, they can or you, you, you don't have to. Kind of and, thing. and again, my question is, Who? if the um, applicant says, and with knowing that they have the burden of proof, say, says that I, I would like So I think if I mean, the shells left shell. in, yeah. they're gonna have yeah. to consider it, but it doesn't. It, it'd be it's like one component. 
of a, of a review. So there's always multiple factions that and pieces that go into a review. So it would be one of them. Is your question also that if you feel there will be, like in a case, um, a culture or historical significance is for the applicant to say, I don't want that to be considered? Or, or that I do want it to be considered. Okay. Yeah. That, again, would just fall in the language whether you ultimately put in there shall, shall or may. Okay. Yeah. And shall would mean you, you, do, you, you require to. to, essentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Trina. Has anyone uh, from the audience, let's, let's put it back out. If there's anyone online that would like to make comment or has questions about this, and again, for those made of join, I, I neglect in the beginning, but we'll take comment in the written form through July 7th and, uh, till 1 o'clock. Looks like Reverend McCafferty has raised her hand. Or, yeah. Okay. Can you hear us, Reverend McCafferty? Yes. Good okay, evening. We, good evening. Um, I will be sending in uh, a public comment, but just in case something happens to me before I do, I do want <laughs> you to know, and I want it on record that I do support the ordinance. Okay. okay. Thank you, Reverend McCafferty. Okay. Good night. Good. Um, I'm going to pose another question, uh, if you don't mind. After listening to the comments, uh, one of my, I think what I've learned is that the burden for uh, social and cultural value or social and cultural is a shared burden and it would be a burden that would be placed on an applicant as well as by on the H Park. Is that the intention here? In other words, it's shared and possibly shared equally? I, I don't think I characterize it that way. Typically, when an applicant comes before the city trying to earn an approval for something, it's right. a, it, it's the burden of persuasion is so on the applicant. Now, there are obviously instances where H Park individual members might help encourage satisfying that burden, you know, right. but, but the burden of persuasion is ultimately on the applicant to persuade the members of the H Park to either approve or deny something. Okay. And I guess what I was thinking is, is that there, this was possibly setting up the expectation that there would be some dive into the cultural and social history of a structure that might not be represented the, outside the ability of the applicant to actually speak to because he or she is a new, a new property owner, you know, doesn't know about the property significance to the town uh, and its historical significance. That's why I was asking this question. Yeah, that, I think that's why I suggest, Councilperson, that perhaps there's instances where, you know, they can, H Park having a certain expertise in what they do, they might have that cultural historic significance right. and they can point it out to an applicant to help, okay. you know, preserve right. that particular right. structure. Thank you. Thank you for letting me do that. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mel McGee. I live at 208 East Market Street. And I hope to be in front of each park in all of the city. And the last thing I want to do is cause a problem. So if you have a question, I'll say whatever you want. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question is this. Um, I bought on my block knowing it was historically registered. I knew I was going to have to go through the commission to have anything done. I live um, in the one little block on Mills Beach that's considered historic. And of that block, seven homes are considered in that district. Five of them remain um, not rehabilitated. One was rehabilitated a few years ago, and that was a, a nightmare for you, I know. And it's really a mess how the house has turned out. Yeah. So in trying to avoid that, um, two of the houses of the five remaining that have not been rehabbed still look as they did prior to 1992 when they were considered part of the historic district. Six foot fences not really following the H Park guidelines. I'm getting ready to put a substantial sum in to rehabilitate my home. And my question is, in looking over all the paperwork for tonight's meeting, I didn't see anything mentioned about homes 
in the historic district that fall into disrepair. And when they do, I know a few years ago there was a problem with a home that actually had to be demolished because it was in the historic district and the proper care was not taken. Mm -hmm. So should it be somewhere in the paperwork addressing what happens to a home in the historic district when it's falling into disrepair? Does the city step in to help out? Um, because here I'm following all the guidelines for the streetscape, and my streetscape's pretty ugly. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to give it up uh, another minute, and then we'll move on to um, the second agenda item. And again, we'll, we'll take comment through July 7th. Okay, let's move on then. So the, the second uh, item is uh, consideration of Ordinance 9-23. This is an ordinance to amend the Municipal Code of the City of Lewis. This is Chapters 170 and um, and land development 197 zoning section 197-54 this has to do with jurisdictions and procedures and 197-62 off street loading as it relates to site development plan review um, so just from a top level this is around um, the remedy around the joint site review committee joint site review was formed with good intentions of a blend where um, you need the expertise of architecture and a site review. Um, unfortunately, it's not really, it's, it's proven to be clunky. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is really an effort to do that, but also at the same time with any of these, it gives us an opportunity to look at the, the code itself and see um, you know, what needs to be cleaned up there. So um, with that being said, I do uh, myself wanted to point out here that with respect to, um, so I'm, I want to point everyone to 170-33. These are lines 85 through 88. Um, and this is just relevant in my mind because we are talking about conversations with uh, accessory dwelling units. Mm -hmm. And so we're, you know, if, if we don't make the effort here, and there's also interesting enough, there's two family dwellings, which also could be relevant if you're talking about an in-house uh, ADU. Um, gazebos and docks, I think we've also seen maybe there is a place for some sort of commission to look at those. Um, dock, dock can morph into marinas, uh, but docks nonetheless, maybe, you know, there's a place. But, but that, that's my point here is, you know, if we're going to say this joint site review is applicable for any of these, I think we might as a body want to consider uh, attached, deta approved detached dwellings, which is curious because in my mind I don't know that it, they are it's even actually saying that it's those are exempt, exempt. from the site development right. yeah exactly but okay. do we then are yeah. we also saying that we are approving detached dwellings because there then we're wasting our time reviewing ADUs because this acknowledges that they uh, exist so and, and that they were and that they're legal. Yeah, we don't even need. I mean, so I think if if the city goes through with the with an ADU um, ordinance, that can be written into that ordinance somehow. That mm -hmm. if there's a review needed, um, so w from um, a review stand process, all single family, all gazebos, all docks, all two family dwellings are reviewed as part of a building permit. So staff's reviewing them. Right. Staff does not look at architecture unless it's in a historic district, and then it gets passed on to the historic district commission. So what we're looking at that then is, are they compliance with lot coverage, site uh, setbacks, height, et cetera? I, I totally agree with you. The only thing it says, then it implies that that's all done administratively for, through approved detached dwellings and two family dwellings, which are both, mm -hmm. my understanding is, are not legal in Lewis. So a detached dwelling is a single family house. Correct. And, it, and a two family dwelling is a duplex, which, we're, which we have a number of and is a conditional use within the city of Lewis. Okay, so this detached so dwelling is, a is, single not diff is the is a same thing as a single family, family. Correct. It, the I way we look, we, we have many de um, versions of a dwelling. Um, the one, a detached is a single family dwelling. Okay. A two family is a duplex. Um, which means any townhouses, apartment buildings, 
any multifamily, I'll require a site plan review. It's what this is saying, so that'll go before Planning Commission and Mayor and Council for those larger developments. Okay. But each individual single family, so if, if uh, Anne Marie is going to build a brand new house on, you know, um, on the beach, um, she's just going through a building permit for review of that, that single family house. Uh, but if there's a, um, but like Dutchman's Harvest, right. the, those multifamily units, that came before the process for review and consideration. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference is um, the smaller things like a gazebo, um, and it should say like detached accessory structures because yeah. those don't go through any, I mean they, again, we're looking at them for size and lot coverage and, and scale and, and for um, setbacks. Um, but yeah, what comes before is is typically what comes before the as proposed would be um, like tonight you had site disturbance we, you have an application for a site disturbance over a certain amount okay or you have um, a commercial addition um, mm -hmm. that we had and they ended up shrinking it so they didn't have to come through the process because it was of a certain size and it was adjacent to residential zone which will then triggers so you might even see like you know a very small building addition in a commercial but because it's adjacent to residential, it triggers that site plan review. Mm -hmm. What you're not seeing is kind of like the day-to-day, -day, you know, single family houses, duplexes. Mm -hmm. What you're gonna see is the fancy pants, the aquamarine yeah. on, um, <laughs> and your <laughs> fancy pants, um, <laughs> fancy pants holdings LLC. No, I remember. I, was, <laughs> I couldn't help it, I love the name. <laughs> um, you're gonna see the schools, you're gonna see additions to the hospital. Right. Um, um, you can see um, if other buildings and commercial, the university does anything of a certain size, that, that will trigger most likely um, a site plan. Okay. okay. So this doesn't refer then to an ADU nor an in a detached ADU nor an in-house ADU? Correct. Okay, good. You Thanks know, for that. Yeah, that's good uh, Going along with what uh, Andrew said, is there any way, <clears throat> you've made it clear, is there any way that can be somehow written into this so that people know right away when they're looking at this, ah, that, that's a building permit. That has nothing to do with a site review. So that it's pretty evident to someone reading it. I just picked that up from the discussion you had here. But uh, it is clear. And you, you mentioned here when it says unless, after unless, is there any way to just put something in there that says, I don't know, something about the typical house would fall under uh, a zoning permit, or a, a permit, building permit, rather than a site plan. So yeah, I think that's why it's stated that way. It's like, unless the building or permit is approved. So <laughs> it's more or less saying, except all of these, ex except, <laughs> except a single family house, mm -hmm. a, a mm -hmm. duplex, mm -hmm. um, gazebos, yeah. docks, Accessory structures, etc. It's just don't sort of go the, through the. F well, where did it look sort of the why isn't there? Well, because mm -hmm. the implication would be right yeah. because if it was not approved, there would be must be need for some sort of site review. Correct. Otherwise, you just approve it, they get their permit, and, and we never even. Because I don't that. think I don't think Mayor and Council and Planning yeah. Commission want to start seeing every brand new house no. come in. Oh and, no. Right. Uh, no. Um, That's right. That actually makes sense. The only reason you would do it would come before us because it doesn't accommodate the site. So therefore, it's not approved because it needs further site development? Yeah, or typically, like, the single-family houses, you're seeing it as a subdivision. Mm -hmm. So you see it before, mm -hmm. so you've already, or you already know what the lots look like with or the street layer or a minor mm -hmm. subdivision. So you already know. Mm -hmm. So it's now, that's been approved. That, so that subdivision's been approved, mm -hmm. and now they're just going to get in the building permit. Right, right, right. Uh -huh. right. How about the piece, though, about, do how, where does a dock then morph into a marina? Um, it would ba be based on um, size. Um, yeah. So for example, the recent work over at Anglers, for example, how, is right. that done without site review because it's under certain linear feet of dock space, or how does that work? So yeah, typically it's a square, it's an overall square footage situation, and there's also the process for an administrative site plan. So a full-blown site plan is, um, uh, I'm building Dutchman's Harvest. 
Got to mm-hmm. go through the, the full process. There was a, um, a building off of King's Highway. They did a 600 square foot addition. Mm-hmm. They provided to us that, yes, because they added office space that now you need to make sure you have your extra parking and your lot coverage is still okay, that staff re- reviews that as an administrative site plan. Okay. So it still goes through some type of site plan. It just doesn't require the public hearing because it's, it's um, of minor uh, in nature. Now again, certain things, if again, if it's adjacent to a residential zone, mm-hmm. it kicks it almost automatically to a full site plan. Um, because again, you could be impacting the residential mm-hmm. neighbors. Great, mm-hmm. just to, and mm-hmm. for clarity, those issues are addressed um, starting with line 127 through 136. Those are, those are the triggers that would get you to um, right. Joint Site Development Review Commission in the past or potentially Planning Commission in the future. Right, and I, that's that section on line number 130 where it speaks to additions to existing structures where additional floor area is greater than 5,000 square feet. And and I would suggest that I, that we probably had a, a, an exception made with one of the reviews during this past year based upon the description of um, uh, 2,500 square feet adjacent to residential uses or residential uses, the non number line number 135 as it applies to uh, dock and what is, I think a dock is, I think somewhere in our book, I think it describes it as five slips or less or fewer, and something over that is, I think that's what triggers a marina. Yeah, I'd have to take a look at that one, because um, again, a dock is, just gets a building permit and goes straight through, as does a gazebo mm-hmm. and, and, a, and a house. But, I think, um, but, but, the, but if, the impact of the structure can be much greater than just a dock. You know, just understood. Right, and um, I actually think that it would be helpful for the building department, not necessarily helpful for the applicant, but helpful for the building department, if in fact there was some kind of community level review of these plans that are as impactful as they are. Uh, speaking of gazebos, um, the term gazebos used used very loosely here. Uh, we, we really have our buildings uh, that are being constructed along the canal, and they do block the view shed, and that view shed is to be protected. And, um, and yet, we have this loosey-goosey uh, term. The applicant can say, I'm building a gazebo. It has a roof, it has four walls. The gazebo is, is defined, and a gazebo and shall not exceed 200 square feet. So if something doesn't meet the definition of a gazebo, it can't be considered a gazebo. So right. for the last year, um, the department, last year, year and a half, we have been more strictly um, enforcing the zoning code as it, as it relates to um, zoning and uses and definitions, because again, a gazebo is defined. Um, a lot of those structures along the canal were issued um, much longer right. ago. They've been there a while. And I would definitely agree, those are not gazebos. Mm-hmm. Um, but going forward, um, the department is making sure that we are, we are more, much more closely following the code. And if there's a question, we usually err on the side of caution, um, which again, you know, we, we try to make sure we're, you know, but I, we I do our best. I, right, and I can appreciate what you're saying. What I guess I'm asking is, don't you think that it would be helpful if your department could rely upon when an applicant comes, uh, application is made, and if the application is pushing the envelope, so to speak, I'll describe it that way, you know, where it's entering that gray area where the enormity of the project is impactful enough that you think, gosh, this is really more than just a simple gazebo, or it's more than just a simple dock. It is, you know, something greater than that. Wouldn't it be helpful for you to be able to say, you know what, I need to refer you, your application is going to have to go through the planning commission for a review, go through that process. But I think that's so, what gives the, the, that flexibility in 88, 
Mm -hmm. Because... 88? Yeah, unless the building or structure is an approved detached dwelling. Right. So that gives, I mean, it should give the department the flexibility to say it's not approved because it's a little beyond, to your point. But, but so, so my concern is, from what I'm hearing, is you want the, the staff to have discretion and go, okay, we're concerned about you, but not about you. And that's where I'm going to be no. concerned about Ooh. equity. No, no, I'm not suggesting okay. that. I'm talking about the if you will, the, the scale if, mm -hmm. of the project, you know, that, that I, I think the answer, though, could possibly be, if you look at D, site development plan subject to planning commission and approval by city council, if they meet the following thresholds, right. put something in to one of those thresholds, you could say any marina expansion. Yeah, um, that's absolutely and, fine. And, yeah. and I think that, that that would cover it and make sure that nothing... I mean, I get the the thought that that marina expansion is, is larger than most things, but it, it truly does not meet any of those criteria. So if we want to make sure we catch such things in the past... Well, it, the, would, go ahead, I'm sorry. I, I think it, it would make sense to say, you know, any marina expansion, that way any time... And a marina is defined, and it's a, a commercial venture. Correct. Anytime a marina is expanded, you're, you'll see it. Right. Um, and but I would also even suggest, for example, on line 164, following page, subsection 170-34, line 164, exterior lighting. Uh, what? Right, but it's still, it, before you even get to going to the Planning Commission, it needs to trigger D1, 2, 3, or 4. So if it doesn't trigger that, we'll the Planning Commission isn't going to see mm -hmm. it. It's going to be a reviewed administratively. And again, this is my, I'm trying to illustrate the point that actually uh, by review, being re a plan being reviewed by a, uh, a committee made up of residents, uh, volunteers, might actually catch things that might otherwise have been overlooked. Right, and which is why it would, it, it, to meet what you're suggesting, putting in a number five, any marina. marina expansion. Because, it, so, I'm not picking up. No, no. Right, so but you're that's concerned one of the things that's out of the box. That's all of these other things. Our, our code is, is really written to deal with buildings and paving. Um, the, so it doesn't, the language in there doesn't address how you deal with that. Yeah, and so well, number two on line 164, exterior lighting. All of section 133 and on actually refers back to section um, 17026, which are standards, and there are landscape standards, um, lighting standards, um, street standards. Right. Yeah, so those are all, so when, when a site plan comes in, I'm checking all those boxes and mm -hmm. making sure that, okay, where's your lighting? Does it meet the code? Um, and I go back, I actually go to 197 and chapter 70 and make sure, okay, they're showing lighting. So, okay, if, if, um, if uh, the school district came in and they wanted, you know, really big, you know, bright lights that go up, well, I'm gonna go back to the new lighting section and go, no, you, you, those have to be shielded and the lighting has to be down. And sometimes I can ask for a lighting plan that is um, signed off by a lighting professional if there's definitely concern. And usually, for an example, in, in uh, larger site plans, um, what I'll ask for is construction details. So you're, I'm asking for an example of what that lighting is going to look like. Or um, how are you constructing the sidewalk and the handicap, handicap um, signage and um, the map and, and the, the crosswalk because it needs to be two feet wide as a minimum for the crosswalk um, width um, and it's got to be a certain type of paint um, but when a site plan comes in which is why one most recently the, a letter went out on Friday was three pages long um, and just a review comment and more or less, and I had, and that was at, at a point I had to stop reviewing because there were a few things missing that I was like, you're gonna give me more. So they got the big bold going, uh, Danger Will Robinson, he, he, you get that back into me before you can go forward because <laughs> you're missing something. Mm -hmm. um, so I, and again, every once in a while I'm gonna miss something. 
but then it keeps going through a review process and a review process. And every time an application comes in, even though I've reviewed it, I'm going through my list, but I'm also checking everything because you'd be surprised the number of times it's like, well, they, I'm, they said they were going to plant these tree, these types of trees, and the next time it comes in, it's like, it's those. Or they forget to turn a layer on in their CAD system. Like, uh, you forgot to turn the, you know, the, the grading plan on. Where did it go? Um, and that happens. And we do a very thorough review um, to make sure we're trying to make sure everything complies with the rules and regulations. Um, because again, everything in the site plan regulations, a lot of the guidelines for a subdivision actually reference or more or less designed for um, a commercial, like all the parking requirements. There's standards about how many trees you have to have in a landscape island in chapter 170. Right. Uh, hopefully that helps. You know, I wanted to make a comment. Uh, 200, line 200. Okay. I really like this section, and I, I don't know what you do now, but I like this pre-application meeting prior to submission of the site development plan. Mm -hmm. uh, the applicant will be able to meet with uh, someone from the city planning department and review the plan prior to getting into a lot of expense mm -hmm. right. and moving ahead with, with plans that could be very costly. So I think that's really a great thing. And um, uh, what I was curious about, when they go through that pre-application process, this is uh, really very, very complex, what's being written here. Mm -hmm. Is there some kind of a simple uh, form that they get from you when they do that pre-application that then goes, morphs into the, the either the, the, the planning review or whatever, that they can kind of follow that? Like a process something real easy that they like fill out they'll have a paper that says we just where they are in this. so there's a checklist okay. um, on the site plan application that says all the code sections I think I actually need to update that um, but typically when somebody comes in with an application um, I'm trying to find the, all the red flags okay. I'm like what do you need a waiver for you know where's your landscape plan where's your stormwater management going you know mm -hmm. Um, you know, you want to build a big metal building. Well, that doesn't really kind of make sense. Um, it's something you can ask for. I try to find all the red flags. Like, oh, where you forgot your sidewalks, you know? Have you talked to DelDOT yet? Um, have you talked to the Board of Public Works about their water and sewer connections yet? So it's a very, they come in with a very high concept. And we just have a conversation about, you know, what they're thinking about doing. And sometimes by the time they come back in, it the plan has shifted significantly. So do they take notes or do you take notes or do they get something back from you saying this looks good, proceed in that direction? I never tell anybody that they have the ability to proceed. It's just, okay. I've met with somebody, I know there's an application coming in. Okay. So one, I can keep it in the back of my head and two, that yes, I've, I've met with them. So it's like, okay, when I do the review, I shouldn't be going, or they know in advance, like okay, they need a waiver request for some type of buffer okay. or something. So they know that ahead of time when they make the application, they're in a better position to make an application and be heard before the commission and then mayor and council. Any other? No. John, I just had one question before we turn to the public. Is, John, the scratch through and then the reference of the fees, because those fees are to remain the same. Mm -hmm. okay. right. Yeah, I wasn't touching that. And I'm going to note line 222 needs the JSDRC needs to replace with Planning Commission. Oh, I yeah, apparently right. missed that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think there's another one somewhere that I missed. What line did you say? 222. 20, 222. No. She, she just didn't cross it off. <coughs> and I know there's another section in uh, Chapter 170 that I, I missed okay. um, because it's not spelled it's out the same line way. 270. Um, yep. Yeah, there's, there's a. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's really. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, are there any comments from the floor? Barbara, come on up. Yeah. Um, I think this is amazing. You know, I don't know how you get all this done. Neither. But um, I think um, what Joe commented about, what I would call <coughs> a user friendly checklist, mm -hmm. is I think it's any time you can take a step back and try and put yourselves 
Mm. Put, your put yourself in shoes of an applicant, maybe, who has never been here before, who has exactly. never done a project like this right. before, and create a, a, a starter checklist, a user-friendly checklist. And I think that works uh, for H Park. I think it works, you know, for any any process that requires <coughs> the public to participate and go through stages. And of course, um, what you're just finished talking about is in much more detail and layered with these large projects. So you would assume that anybody embarking on that that type of project, that large scope. You know, has is not isn't green to this. You know, they're, they're hopefully it's only the professionals that you're meeting with. It's the mm -hmm. architects, the engineers, and people like that. They know what they're doing, and you know they probably don't need their handheld. But um, for the rest of the general public, I know before H Park, we have applicants that have never done a project ever, 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 mm -hmm. and they're drawing it, and and they think that's all anybody needs, <laughs> and you're just asking questions because you have no idea what they what they're planning to do or what they want to do. But, um, and I, I like the idea, I know um, we've talked about trying to require a pre-meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really know how you do that. Um, it hasn't worked so far. It's been offered, uh, suggested. Hmm. Um, I know um, John would like to do that more and more. Um, larger projects, you know, like St. Peter's, I mean, they want to meet, hmm. you know. they. <laughs> Barbara, when you say pre-meeting, you mean like with the committee, with the com full well, committee? Well, it probably would be um, the building official, mm -hmm. myself. Um, so different than a than a chair and staff, then. No, no, no. Okay. It's not, a, it, and it's not a decision making. Yeah. It's really. Oh, it's just because the, the reason I brought that up is the planning commission has moved to that as part of their site of their development right. review. They had they John Horner actually just came in recently. So that's slightly different. So the pre-application meeting, so like for any site plan and any subdivision, they need to meet with staff mm -hmm. prior to the submission of an application. Mm -hmm. um, we try to encourage people, but sometimes they just submit a, an application for a building permit and that's when it triggers H Park. Mm -hmm. So they don't always quite know. And then we try to reach out to them. Um, we do do a lot of handholding in the department mm -hmm. um, because again, you know, I think I met with, usually the first thing, if somebody's trying to do an application, um, for a new construction and I meet with them I'm like okay the first thing you're gonna need to do is find an engineer <laughs> um, you know because that's gonna be your first step you know and I don't ever recommend anybody um, you know I say maybe see if they've gone through the city's process before um, and then I'm you know most of the engineers I know I've, I've known for about almost 20 years now um, because they're the same engineers in this throughout the state so I know most of them, and um, and then again, I've had uh, mm -hmm. people who just need to do a conditional use for something, and it's and they're on their own, and I did it all the time at the county. It's like okay, we walk them step by step, and I'd write out sometimes. It's like okay, this is what you need. Um, for here, um, if this is approved, I'm going to go back and change our flow chart, so people actually have a copy of the flow chart and kind of helps them so they know where they are mm -hmm. in the process. We have an existing one that references the joint site. We have one for the subdivision process. Um, so we, we, uh, we do try, and there is a checklist. Sometimes it's a very code um, uh, language uh, checklist, but we do try to explain. I'm like, you need a landscape plan. And so I, I try to break it down like a landscape plan. Tell me how many trees and what type of tree you're planting. You know, um, or you know, um, what's your sign going to look like? Where are you trying to put your sign on your on your property? Um, so we do our best to try to help everybody through the process, and ev everybody has different needs. So we we try to bend to uh, all the all the needs of all the applicants. Yeah, and I, I know, um, you know, this I think this is really hard to figure out, being that we're not in those shoes, and I don't know whether. I just don't know how to resolve it. Um, you know, we've tried to do the suggest pre-meeting, especially for anybody who has, uh, for H Park, I'm talking about, um, has never been here before. Um, sometimes we get requests for them, and that's really great, and it saved a lot of time for everybody. But um, I know Anne Marie suggested a while back that maybe H Park could <coughs> come up with a sample application. You know, and um, maybe 
that has some validity. I, I don't know. Or maybe, um, <coughs> you know, just, you know, I think just the simplest checklist mm -hmm. that a user friendly, that everybody understands. And so, I mean, trying to go online, the city's website, and find something that you're unfamiliar with is torturous. <laughs> it really is. You know, if you're not used to websites and if you're not, it, it just is, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a warm and fuzzy feeling. And it's not a good feeling. It doesn't build good relations. Well, it's pretty scary when you've yes. bought a historic property or a property and you find out that, and if you're doing a lot of it yourself or, you know, you're hiring contractors to work with you, it can be pretty daunting. Yes. And uh, I, I think uh, you might want to add it to your booklet. Uh, mm -hmm. I really appreciated seeing the checklists that you have mm -hmm. for the uh, historic buildings. And I, I kind of looked at that and thought, boy, I wish I had that when I did my project. It wasn't historic, but boy, that would have helped me. Uh, but you didn't have to come before ABC? No, no. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's yeah. difficult when you're doing these projects. Well, it so is. It is. And it sounds like they're really trying to streamline things. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> getting rules and things. Yeah, I think it's, organized. you know, I think everything I think the city's doing is they're doing, a, a, they're working really hard, they're, um, and they're doing a great job. I just think they don't have, they're not able to look at everything from the person that walks in the street cold, never doing any of this. And, and that's a, mm -hmm. And that's kind of like a user-friendly guidelines. And, and I've looked at a lot of other cities for preservation guidelines, as some of the other H Park commissioners have as well. And you read and you, you pull them up. They don't look anything like our code. Nothing. They're pictures. They're, they're wording that is everyday descriptions that people understand. They're not code. I don't know, somewhere there's a code there, I guess. I haven't found it. I just find what we call a user-friendly guide. You know, it just walks you through and how to do stuff and what to do and what you shouldn't do. And it, it's, um, I just think it's, a, it's like a translation, you know, from English to French. It's, it's really, it's, it's that, you have to kind of think of it that way. You can't think of it the way you've always been working that you're used to. Barbara, it sounds like that might be a, a goal in the future. Um, I know just from the short time I've been here, we have a lot on our, our plates. I know you Our do. zoning department and building department, they're inundated. And um, I think they're trying to work toward that is, is what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think the intent's there. It just, <coughs> yeah. It's hard. I think it's really hard when you're always used to doing everything in English to all of a sudden do it in French. You know, yeah. it, it's, it's that kind well, of feeling. It, Okay. I do want to remind everybody that until 2016, we didn't even have a plan. Planner, right. So, you know, we, we really, in the, in the years since we did get a planner on staff, we've made a lot of strides. Um, you know, the checklist that we have, the application processes, the flow charts, all of those um, mm -hmm. have been done um, initially with Tom and then Janelle has built on that. So, so again, if we were a larger municipality that had a large staff to do these things, sure, they'd be done already. It, when we're talking about what Barbara is bringing up with <coughs> nice graphics, I mean, we're talking about something we'd have to hire a consultant to do because, you know, we, we simply don't have the Bandwidth. staff to do it. Or, or, or that, frankly, other than blue, none of us really have any um, graphic design background. So. So I think if we really, I, I think that's a great idea, but if we want to do that, that's a, a, a resource allocation that we need to make and make it a priority. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Anyway, thank you very thank much. You. All right. Appreciate it. Yeah, one more. Yeah, go ahead, Tim. Uh, I want to ask if there is uh, inconsistency here, possibly a, a conflict. On page 15, line 378, uh, <coughs> So refer a site development plan application to H Park when the mayor and city council determines the architecture of the building requires additional review. And so that's, and then on page 17, line 497, this is a list at the end of things that uh, H Park shall not have jurisdiction over. Mm -hmm. 
So what um, line 479 and 478 are saying is that they don't fall under the jurisdiction of H Park, but the other section says you plan, and if there's a section for planning commission and or mayor and council, there's the section references both, right. that if you want them to review something, you can send it to them. It just means um, they don't have to. That that right now commercial because because right now um, the way it reads is because of the way the joint site was created mm -hmm. that they have review over all the commercial district all the commercial buildings throughout the city um, and they did provide um, um, clarity on on um, wording for that um, at their meeting when when this was before them and I just cannot remember it but it, it was a little bit cleaner but um, this I think is on line 378, I think this is a tool that you're giving mayor and council. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Okay. Correct. And it's giving yeah. the planning commission and mayor and council the ability if there's a concern about the architecture of the building, right. mm -hmm. of any type of building, and you want some architect, the architectural experts of the city to take a look and provide some guidance, correct. you have the ability to send it there. Yeah. And that is what this is. That's doing. what that and says. it is fully compatible with the language on line 497. Yes. Mm -hmm. It is. Okay. Yes. I just wanted to make sure that, you know, we weren't arguing against ourselves. So You're not. <clears throat> real quick, Barbara. Okay, real quick. All right. Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure how, what, what happened here, but when um, Park and HPC were combined, mm -hmm. um, Park's jurisdiction was the whole town, but just commercial. Right. And the idea was we weren't going to lose that review process, not for site plan, not for anything right. else, just that there should be some type of, you know, for compatibility in the historic character is, or something, you know. And so I, I you know. Uh, and that would be done by H Park? Is that well, that was the intent. The intent was right. when CARC and HPC were combined right. mm -hmm. that one commission was going to mm -hmm. do both jobs. Right. Under, under this, planning commission would have that role. So there would still be that role. It would be planning commission that would... Now, if there's a, a, a commercial building, say, on 2nd Street, yeah, that, so still goes still that still goes to H Park. That still goes to H Park. Outside right. of the historic district. Correct. Right. That it now falls onto Mayor and Council, so Planning Commission, and Mayor and Council with the ability to send it to H Park for, for so review. So basically, Park right. has lost, has just been totally lost this way. Because well, if a commercial, if anything commercial outside the historic district was supposed to come to H Park, that was the intent of combining. Well, it was Joint Site Development Review Commission, that which is why the next application on this evening's agenda went to Joint Site Development Review Commission because it was a change to a, a commercial building. A, 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 it was a commercial exterior renovation with the, the paving. So that's why that went to Joint Site Development Review Commission. That under this ordinance will go to planning commission. But uh, when H when CARC and HPC were combined, um, the idea was H Park was going to do what CARC had done and what right. HPC had done, right. and and CARC was reviewing building applications that were commercial and H. Or it was yeah doing residential and that, that and Clark Clark was and Clark a, was was doing all of the city right and HPC was only doing historic the historic district, district. Right. so that whole that whole a review process by Clark has a kind of been lost in the shuffle not intentionally of course but um, and it it really did the joint uh, site plan review didn't completely. It, it tried to do that, but it didn't. It didn't really because sometimes we were doing site review and not no building. You know, and mm. Clark was Clark wouldn't have done that either. I don't think. Right. Um, so anyway, I just you know I, I'm getting concerned about that. It seems to have totally slipped, and 
And I'm not sure that's what you want to do. So my time well, is to the wayside. And correct me if I'm wrong. I'm going to try to rephrase what I think I hmm? have okay. learned this evening. Okay. Um, I think that what Janelle has assured us is, is that this actually, this language actually uh, gives the mayor and council the tool to be able to refer any kind of, com any commercial uh, design mm -hmm. to H Park for your review and uh, that's MR33. Uh, uh, you know, your review. Only if it's going to come to you for site plan review, not yeah. if it's not um, totally. I mean, it used to be yeah. that if somebody wanted to put new shutters on a commercial building, it would go to Park. Park. No, and, I'm and about site development. No. I'm not right, about but what Barbara's talking about I'm not was talking about small, small changes, yeah. Yeah. small talking, changes yeah. to the facade of a commercial building, and when when the ordinance that brought the two together was adopted, some of that did come out. For the smaller projects that didn't, that were not in the historic district, mm -hmm. for things that did not involve site disturbance, new construction, mm. um, if it's you know cosmetic changes to a building outside of the historic district, uh, and, but that change add, was made. So if we were to add to F, to say refer a site development or commercial application can could be referred to H Park. Um, so I, I think that the concern there is sometimes we'll get permits for just new windows. Mm -hmm. um, the only people who are going to see the new window is the building per, building officials. They're going to review that and move, process yeah. that. Um, typically if somebody's putting on new shutters they're going to review that and process that. Right. Um, if they're going to paint the actually we don't see paint color um, what typically um, zoning's going to see is if we knew a new, see a building addition mm -hmm. typically we're making sure that the architecture matches the existing mm -hmm. building because that's what makes sense because that's what usually right. most people want to do is is tie that in so but for five years for the last five years there has not been any public review of those you know cosmetic um, alterations. alterations on the exterior of commercial buildings. However, there were things, and, and that was based on the way this, this ordinance was drafted. However, there are things that previously were fully administrative review that now do go through site plan, such as schools, changes at the hospital, um, it, like for instance, the, the library had, um, it went through a rezoning process, but the review of the building and the site plan was done administratively. So when, when this ordin when the ordinance that has, right, mm -hmm. that has the process that exists today, CARC had jurisdiction over commercial buildings, but not industrial, right. not institutional mm -hmm. so there was a huge gap there um, you know churches one, one of the things that went to joint site development review recently was a church yes yeah, those things were did not go to CARC previously so um, in this ordinance it made sure that all of the whether it was commercial or institutional that they're all covered by the code more based on their size versus whether they were commercial or institutional or educational or whatever. So not on use, but on mm. size. Right, mm. correct. And that's that's typical throughout the country, is you have some type of administrative review for something that's minor, mm -hmm. and then if it's larger, then it needs to go through a full review process. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And this still allows for the option for if, if you know, you get, and there was um, a little bit of language added to the to the to the boot to the ordinance to make sure, like, there's no large expanses of blank walls and a few other things about architecture to kind of beef up the architecture section. Um, at, but it still allows both the planning commission and council, if there's a concern and they need more information or want to re reference uh, um, resources, that they can send it to to the commission. So what CARC used to do is now going to planning commission and mayor and council. Okay. I just want to be clear, I'm not looking for more work. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not I, I, and, and I just was trying
trying to make sure that you know it, that everybody realized what went on and you know right. it wasn't falling through the cracks. Yes. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyone online that's looking to comment? Mm -mm. Okay. All right then. Let's move on. I think. Is this Friday at one as well? The, yeah, yeah, the, both. Um, yeah, all, July seventh at one for okay. comments. All, all these except for the okay. last one. We may not. Well, we may not go there. Yeah. And need to. So, uh, Jack, I don't know if you want to come up and introduce this, or you're fine with Janelle introducing it. Your call. <laughs> Janelle, you want to go ahead. So this is. Um, potentially the last application to go through the Joint Site Development Ad Hoc Review Committee. Um, and the reason it went through the Joint Site Development Ad Hoc Review Committee um, was because one, it's adjacent to residential zoning, and to the back and to the side, mm -hmm. and the, the site disturbance was over 2,500 square feet. Oh, so okay. those two items triggered the full site plan review. Oh, is that Okay. So that's why you're looking, it's a, it's a parking lot. This I request know, I mean, it is- it seems so small. Yes, because it, the way the, the code reads is site disturbance, uh -huh. which a uh, brand new parking lot is site disturbance. So it got triggered and okay. required the full site plan application. Okay. Um, because they didn't do any changes to the exterior of the building, we got them through the interior changes of the building. Um, so what you're looking at is- Six parking spaces, right? Mm -hmm. Seven, I think, yeah. Seven. Um, okay, seven, five. And there were the, the Joint Site Development Ad Hoc Review Committee, and I can't wait to stop saying that, um, <laughs> I did make some recommendations regarding landscaping. There were some comments from the neighbors with concerns about stormwater management. Um, my understanding is they've reduced the requirement. They got it under the 5,000, which required a detailed plan from the Conservation District. Okay. So now they just need a general plan, and the Conservation District has reviewed this. That was included in your packet. Um, so there was concern about making sure that the runoff doesn't go into right. the neighboring property. Um, and then some moving of the parking spaces a little bit farther away from the property line, mm. and maybe putting some landscaping to kind of buffer the area, um, and that's what came out of the, and they did uh, recommend um, approval to mayor and council for tonight, and the applicant is here um, to explain it. I think you explain, you explain yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have any that, questions. So is this in an effort, like, is it required to have eight spaces, and that's why yes. they need to create yeah, I was that? Wondering. So because they successfully have created the eighth spot. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, because of the use, why. Um, it is a personal service. It's a wellness spa because of the use and the square footage. Okay. It triggered the number of parking spaces. And so would the option have been available to them to ask for a waiver of that accommodation? That would have been a variance to the Board of Adjustment. So he would have gone to oh. the He would have had to go to the Board of Adjustment and make an argument as to why they couldn't provide the number of parking spaces. And okay. based on the depth of the property, yeah, I, think I, think, I think that would have been a difficult I think um, request. Bringing it here is so. Um, and in either way, they were again to the left side is zoned residential, uh -huh. and then f in the behind. And again, this is a deep lot. This lot I think is over 200 feet deep, which is kind of unusual. Yeah. Behind it is also residential. Oh, So I see, it being I see. Tr it being the site disturbance, in the new parking area of over 2,500 square feet. And it being oh, adjacent to residential kicked it it's to the full. Mm -hmm. oh, the see. two of them now combined triggered right. the original site plan. They had over <laughs> 6,000 square feet of okay. site disturbance, which automatically triggered the full site plan. And then they reduced that sum, so they're still over the 25, and it's adjacent to residential. So I don't think I realized there were multiple. He's in, he's in code. He, they had, wow. They've had one public hearing where the neighbors have made some suggestions. Yes. The, they're part of the conditions now. Yes. And so right now we're just here to, if there's more. Here if there's anybody else who has concerns. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes. All right, so there's nothing. Uh, yeah, you don't, you're not making a decision tonight. It's just. Oh, all right, well, okay. we know that. Yeah, yeah. I had a question. But it's, in, it's nothing special about the meeting. He's not asking for less spaces. He's in code. No. There's, there's, perfect, right. there's plenty of impervious. This is to hear if other people have this concerns. This is the hearing because. They need seven parking spaces the on the site. Yeah. Okay, it's, okay. The, it's the, the process. Only, the parking it's a plan very that unique is one. being considered is yes. the eight space parking mm -hmm. one, right? Yes, it's right, okay. all that parking area. I just want to make sure the other plan you know that started. Went. Is that right? So there was an original plan and then there was a revised plan. Right. 
So um, you and keep the one then. And then the revised, so I provided everything. That's fine. Mm -hmm. um, right. okay. It's only the revised one here. Correct. Of. And oh. I expect some changes uh, based on the conditions uh, that um, when the final site plan comes in, it might change slightly as well. Because okay. I think there was concern about um, those parking spaces, all that gravel up to the property yeah. line. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I believe the applicant had stated they were amenable to pushing some of that gravel a couple feet back. So there'd be a little bit more grass in that area. Oh, okay. Along okay. that back property line. Correct. Oh, that side property line. I, I had a question. On the, on, on the left side. Right. If you're looking left, at all the streets, it's the left no side here. across this from where the striped the parking spaces okay. are. Right. All right. So, right. so, he's, so they're, they're talking about here is scraping is, this. Is, um, if you <laughs> go all the way out and you can show the entire site blue, please. And that doesn't even get quite all of it. Uh -huh. You can see how far back that goes. Yeah, I'm surprised so, I didn't realize it went the, that far back. The neighboring property fronts Kings Highway. Right. Yes. Right. And so, and the and the the two to the left and the one to the rear are all zoned residential. Ah. Uh -huh. okay. okay. All right. All right. I had a question. Okay. Please, you know, just two things I noticed. Um, I noticed they put curbs between the parking spaces. They show curbing. Is there a reason they had to put curbing between the the, the black lines, or is That's that just not, a, It's just a demarcation oh, of, this, of, I looked of at the, the line. And, and it, it said that that was a code for a, a curve. But the other thing yeah. I wanted to know is the spaces, the sizes, um, they show 10 by 20. Correct. And I, I thought I saw in uh, some notes a few months ago about the size of parking spaces required for the streets. And it looked like they were a little less than 20 by 10. They might have been was it 18 or 19 by 10? And I thought maybe they could cut them back a little if they wanted to. So staff has proposed an ordinance because right now there are two parking requirements in the, in the city code. One is for residential, which is a nine feet by 18 feet. Yes. And then there's a commercial parking space, which oh. is 10 by 20. Okay. The staff has not been successful in getting it changed. So it's all consistent at nine feet, nine by 18. Um, now, if you look, the handicapped one is gonna be slightly different because they they do an extra um, area on the side that meets their Wouldn't the smaller option be better for them? I personally, from a professional perspective, um, prefer the 9 by 18. Yeah. However, the 10 by 20 is the code requirement. Yeah. Oh, so they have to use the 10 by 20? They do have 20. to do okay. the 10 by okay. 20. It's the code requirement. It's, okay. okay. It's a better Just thought I'd ask. Yeah. <laughs> it gives you more room for doors yeah. and yeah. things right. like that. Larger vehicles. Okay. Yeah. Anyone online have any comments? <coughs> Let's do any hands raised over there. No. Okay. Anybody here? All right. Anyone in the audience? All right. Okay. Jack, we should have moved, should have moved you up. <laughs> yeah. 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 We're sorry about yeah, that. Man. All right. So uh, with that, then I'm going to call it to uh, to a close and yeah. uh, if I can get a motion to adjourn. I'll make motion. 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 Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. All right. Thanks, everyone. And comments still seven. Mm -hmm.